Okay. All right. So we are going to introduce tonight's speaker, um, Norman Damaris, Professor Emeritus at Providence College, is a member of Le Regiment Bourbonnais, the Second Rhode Island Regiment, and the Brigade of the American Revolution. He is the editor in chief of the Brigade Dispatch, the Journal of the Brigade of the American Revolution, and the author of the Guide to the American Revolutionary War series and America's First Ally, France in the American Revolutionary War. He has also translated the Gazette Francoise, the French newspaper published in Newport, Rhode Island by the French fleet that carried Count Rochambeau and 5,800 troops to America in July, 1780. And I'm going to turn this over to you. Well, thank you very much. And uh, thank you all for joining me this evening. Um, this is, this, uh, this diary hasn't been published in 250 years because it's been, uh, in private hands until 1979, and uh, it uh, became it when the owner of it died. Uh, he instructed his sister to uh, donate it to the Bibliothèque Nationale, where it's been since uh, 1979 and uh, pretty much unknown. Um, this is a relatively a very important diary, uh, not only because it's 250 years old, but it's because it was written by uh, Rochambeau's nephew and aide de camp. Um, in addition to that, uh, this uh, Comte de Lauberdier was uh, one of four quarter, uh, five quarter, uh, assistant quartermasters general in the French army. He and one other uh, soldier are the only two who, made, who kept diaries. I'm currently working on the other diary, <coughs> and um, <coughs> but this is this is the more important one in my estimation. Um, it's, it's given me material for eight published articles, and uh, several people have commented to, to me about how uh, they found it important. One man, one fellow in particular, is the head ranger at uh, Stony Point, and he told me that uh, in reading this, the, the, the diary answered a question that he's been puzzled over for 15 years. Um, as important as the diary is, I want to start off by talking about what's not in the diary. And what I mean by that is that the diary came with a number of inserts, which I translated, but they didn't get published in the uh, in the text. Um, one of those is an issue of the Gazette Francoise. As uh, Sarah mentioned, I uh, translated the uh, Gazette uh, some about 20 years ago. And uh, up in the upper right corner, you can see where uh, you can get access to a facsimile version in uh, PDF format or um, an English translation at the same location. Um, this is the front page of the, the Gazette. There are six issues plus a supplement. And um, one of the inserts in this diary was a supplement to the Gazette. Uh, for many for quite a long time, I assumed that it was the, the supplement to the Gazette Francoise, and I was excited because this was issue nine, number 93. Um, since there were only six issues and a supplement published, uh, many people thought that the, uh, the, the diary, the, the Gazette had gone out of existence. If you look in this, uh, the second column right here, there's an English and French uh, art, uh, advertising uh, announcing that the newspaper needed some rags to uh, to um, continue publishing. Uh, there was a shortage of rags, and the, the paper at that time was all handmade with uh, with the rag content. So the, uh, the 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 ad is requesting rags, and people thought that because there were no issues after the sixth issue, that this, the publication had ceased. But yet, right underneath the uh, the ad. It, uh, the, the Gazette announces that they are planning to publish an almanac and um, uh, they were going to continue publication into 1781. Well, um, since there are only six issues existing, there, there's only one copy of the, uh, the six issues that I, I mentioned. Uh, they are held at the, uh, the uh, Rhode Island Historical Society. And uh, I've seen many iterations of this diet, this uh, gazette. Uh, I've seen them in paper, in uh, microfilm, and uh, digital. But all of them have a tear in the last page of the issue. 
the tear is always at the same place and exactly the same. So that tells me that the, the six issues are only one exemplar of the, uh, the, the whole set. So when I came across the supplement to issue number 93, um, I assumed that it was the, uh, the issue to this uh, Gazette Francoise, and I was all excited about having discovered this to find out that there had been some 85 issues published between uh, 1780 and the end of 1781. Uh, at the top here, you see the last, uh, the supplement to the, uh, the last issue of the Gazette Francoise that uh, I was just talking about. And below you see the, uh, the supplement to, to the Gazette and you notice that the, the, uh, the typeface is almost exactly the same. The layout is pretty much the same. The, um, the masthead is a little bit different. And so that, that led me to assume that uh, the, the supplement was from the Gazette Francoise. When I uh, finished this, uh, I started doing some research with the, uh, 18th century newspapers. And I found that the, uh, this particular supplement that's inserted with the, uh, the diary is not from the Gazette Francoise, but from the Gazette de France. And um, the Gazette de France predates the, the, Gazette, de, uh, the Gazette, Gazette Francoise, but the, uh, the, uh, the Gazette de France was published in Paris rather than in Newport. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned that the, uh, the last issue of the, the Gazette indicated that there was going to continue publication with an almanac. It did publish the almanac in 1781. It also published the uh, Voyage de Newport à Philadelphie, Albany, et cetera, uh, by the uh, Francois Jean Marquis de Châtelieu. Marquis de Châtelieu was uh, one of the main uh, soldiers. Uh, well, he was, he commanded the Soissonnet Regiment in, in uh, Newport. And, uh, this particular issue was uh, first published by the, uh, the, 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 the press of the, the fleet that published the Gazette Francoise. So it did publish in, into 1781. Uh, there were 27 issues or 27 copies of this booklet published uh, by the Gazette, by the, uh, the, 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 the press. And uh, the Comte de Lobelier owned one and he makes reference to it in several places in his diary. <coughs> Another thing that uh, was uh, included with the with the diary uh, on, the, on the fly pages of the diary, uh, there was a map. Most people are familiar with this particular map. This is the uh, map of uh, Newport uh, by Admiral. There was uh, it, it's got the, the the name of Admiral Detouche up here in the in the uh, in the uh, masthead, but. Um, uh, Admiral de Touche took over from uh, Admiral de Ternay. I'll talk about uh, Admiral de Ternay's death a little later, but uh, he took over as the Admiral of the fleet uh, when de Ternay died on December 15th, uh, 1780, 1780. His uh, successor uh, was appointed, uh, Admiral de Barra was uh, named de, de, uh, uh, the, the successor to uh, de Ternay. He took command on May 13th, 1781. This is uh, de Touche's map. So this had to be published within the first quarter of 1781, which means it's at least six months after the, the landing itself, the landing of the troops in Newport. And you can see this green part up here and down here are three indications where uh, there were um, landing sites uh, identified. Uh, this particular map was probably copied or a map, uh, done on the basis of the uh, Berthier brothers maps, who were the Berthier, uh, Louis Alexandre Berthier was uh, uh, Rochambeau's main cartographer. And if you read his diary, he talks about marking the landing sites, not as actual landing sites, but as potential landing sites where we could, they, the French could expect an enemy attack. Well, the, the map that, that's included in uh, Lobedier's diary is this particular one. And uh, you notice that up here, there is no landing site identified as in the, uh, the Detouche map, but the, there are landing sites down here. Uh, I'm gonna focus on, the, on those in a, uh, this is a, a detail of that map. And you see that the, um, the landing sites are over here uh, in these two areas. 
Now, most people think that the uh, the, the French landed at uh, at the, the port at Long Wharf in, New, in Newport, and that is not the case. Uh, Lobedet is the only diary that talks about the actual landing site. They, all the diaries talk about the landing, but they talk about the mechanics of the landing and um, the the details about who lands and when and stuff like that. Uh, uh, Lobedet is the only one who identifies the landing site, and he's the only one who marks them on the map here. <coughs> and uh, he doesn't identify them on the actual date of, of the landing, but on October 7th, in, uh, uh, by October, the, the troops are getting uh, rather bored and um, antsy. They, they've had, they were at sea for three months. They were uh, in camp for another four months, and they're getting really anxious to get into a fight. So uh, Rochambeau is having them play war games. And he identifies the war games as being held down here at Woods Castle. And Lobedet identifies Woods Castle as the landing site on that date. So some of the maps have Woods Castle down here at what is now uh, uh, Satuous Point. Others put them up here, uh, have, have Woods Castle up here, around here at Black Point, um, which is another landing site over here. So the French actually landed in the, at these two beaches. And uh, so Wood apparently owned this whole area on the east part of, uh, of the Aquidneck Island. <coughs> uh, another thing that Bertier, that uh, Lobedier mentions is that the, uh, the landing site was five miles from the camp. And if you measure the camp from here, which is, the, this is the Soissonnet Division uh, camp. If you measure this out to Satchewitz Point across the causeway, it is exactly five miles. So the, the French troops marched over the causeway and came here to, um, to set up the camp here. Now, why did they not land here at Easton's Beach? Because uh, if you notice this line of defense up here, this, this was all a British line of, uh, of defense works that they created. And um, there's a readout up here, and there's another readout over here. So if this, this area, this is all, this is where the cliff walk is today along here. So they couldn't land on this side. They would have had to land over here and come, come up the hill over here. But um, if this area was occupied militarily, these two, these two redoubts could have been uh, commanding artillery over the beach area, and this would have been the equivalent of landing at no uh, Omaha Beach in Normandy. Um, while we're talking about maps, I want to point out uh, this particular map, and um, I don't know if you can see this green, this green mark up here and this red one. The red the red square identifies Turo Synagogue, and the green square identifies the uh, the Baptist Church. This square over here is Washington Square, and this building is the Colony House. Now, most people think that the uh, the French used the Colony House as a military hospital when they landed. I'll be talking about the Baptist Church as the the, the hospital uh, a little bit later. Well, going back to the landing. Um, the uh, as I mentioned, the troops landed on the, at Satuous Point. The only troop, the only people who landed at uh, in, in the, uh, the the Newport Harbor area was uh, Count de Rochambeau, his son Donatien uh, de, de Vimeur, and uh, Jacques de Beville, who was the quartermaster general of the army. Um, we have the idea that the uh, the French were greeted by a big brass band and military troops and a big a lot of fanfare. In point of fact, uh, there was nobody to, to greet the uh, the soldiers uh, when they arrived. Uh, there were some boats that went out to check to see what the what ships were coming into port, but uh, there were no pilots to bring the ships in, so they had to come in on their own. Um, Admiral de Ternay ordered that the uh, the last ship in the fleet would be the one to be the only one to anchor in the uh, in the harbor, uh, and that was the Amazon. So the Count de Rochambeau and uh, Jacques de Beville and uh, Donatien de Vimeur uh, had to disembark their ship, which was the Duc de Bourgogne, and they boarded the Amazon, 
And from the Amazon, they took the captain's pinnace and went ashore. <clears throat> and then they had to row ashore. Um, this this uh, uh, photo here, uh, this boat on the left is, the, is a pinnace. The one on the right is a cutter. So this would be the type of boat that the, uh, the, the generals would have used to, to, uh, to land. Um, long before Boston had the big dig, Newport had the big fill. All this area here in gray is all landfill. So you can see how, how far in the, uh, the shore went in the 18th century from what it is today. The, uh, this is Washington Square. Uh, here's the Colony House and the, um, the, the, the Baptist Hospital is up here on, um, actually it's right here on, uh, Bar uh, right here on Barney Street. Um, so the, those, those four men, with, those three men were the only ones to, to land. And once they, uh, they landed, um, Baron de Viomini realized that uh, the general was alone on land by himself so he ordered the Grenadier Company of the Bourbonnais Regiment to go ashore to be his bodyguard. Um, <clears throat> now remember that the the French were the uh, the enemy uh, of the Americans in the war in the French and Indian War or the uh, the, the Seven Years' War, as it's noted in Europe. So they uh, they were not very well uh, appreciated when they first arrived. So. Uh, there was nobody to greet them. There was no no big, big fanfare, and uh, Rochambeau found nobody to speak with. Uh, he was wandering around looking for a possible campsite when uh, he met a, uh, a Mr. Wanton, um, and that was probably a John Wanton, as uh, Joseph Wanton was a, 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 a loyalist, and he was um, after the British left Newport, uh, he he left also. So when Rochambeau arrived, he started, he spoke with Mr. Wanton. Mr. Wanton invited him to his house for, for tea. And uh, they talked for a while. He, they, he offered him some horses and so on. But um, uh, the Rochambeau wanted to speak to somebody who was in military command. So Christopher Green, who was Colonel of the Rhode Island Regiment was in the area with 12 men from the Rhode Island Regiment. So he was sent for, and when he arrived, he sent for um, for General Heath, who was uh, probably in Boston at the time. And uh, General Heath came down to, to Newport the following day. <coughs> These are other diaries that uh, and other sources that that corroborate Rochambeau's um, uh, and uh, Lobardier's instruct uh, comments about how there was nobody to uh, to greet the soldiers. Now I mentioned that the uh, the Grenadier Battalion was the one that went was the, the ones that went to shore to uh, to uh, to serve as his bodyguards. Well, this is an illustration of the uh, Soissonnais Regiment, the Grenadier Company of the Soissonnais Regiment. The company would have been about a hundred men, and in order to be a Grenadier, you had to be at least five feet eight inches tall, and these uh, bearskin caps added another eight to twelve inches to your height. So it looked like uh, these people were giants. And whenever, since there was no police force at that time, whenever there was a riot or anything, the Grenadier Company was the one to go out and uh, uh, quell, quell the riot and, and keep the peace. So uh, they were the ones who went ashore and um, served as his bodyguard. The, uh, the troops arrived, uh, with the, the, first, the ships arrived on July 10th. Um, in Newport, the, it was a very foggy day, and uh, Rochambeau disembarked about three o'clock in the afternoon. The fog lifted about noontime, so he went ashore about three o'clock, and <clears throat> the rest of the fleet uh, came into the harbor about uh, five o'clock that afternoon. Uh, they did not land uh, on that day. There was no uh, no no straw, no water available, uh, and no firewood available, so that. They had nothing to use in, in camp. So um, they did not unload that, that day. They started unloading on the, on the 13th. The 13th, 14th, 15th, and 15th, the troops un, uh, disembarked. And on the 16th, the artillery was unloaded. So by the night of uh, July 16th, 
all of the troops were in camp. Now, the troops were aboard the ship for some three months. Um, it didn't take all that long to come across the, the, the ocean, but um, they had some storms. And uh, shortly after they left, uh, they had not passed the, uh, the island of Ushant when two of the, the ships collided and they had to go back for repairs to the harbor. So they, uh, they went back to, to Brest and uh, they, were dis they disembarked there, repaired the ships, um, and then set out again. And uh, there were a few storms and the tides that were against them. So that uh, created some further delays. <coughs> so by the time they arrived, uh, the, the passage took 74 days to, uh, to cross the ocean. But the, the troops had been on board ship for over three months. So by the time they arrived in Newport, uh, some 800 of the soldiers were, were sick from uh, either seasickness or, or scurvy or whatever. Um, and um, there were some 1,500 sailors who were ill. So they needed to find hospitals. The, there was a hospital set up in Providence at uh, uh, what was then called the College of Rhode Island. Uh, that building still stands. It is now University Hall of Brown University. Uh, another hospital was set up at, uh, in Bristol, Rhode Island at Papasquash Point, and uh, a third hospital was set up in Newport, not at the Colony House, but at the, at the Baptist Church. And um, during that, that year, the, 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 the troops were in Newport for almost a year, 11, 11 months and, and a, little, a little bit longer. So in that period, there were 153 deaths in Newport and 27 deaths in Providence. 35% of those uh, soldiers in Newport died in August and September, and 44% in August and September in Providence, making that uh, those two months the most the uh, did the deadliest months of the uh, the French uh, the French presence in Newport. Uh, the most common diseases in camp uh, in that in the 18th century was scurvy, ague, which is malaria and um, dysentery, cholera, and smallpox. However, the, the French soldiers probably did not die of smallpox as they were all inoculated before coming over. Um, this is another passage about, uh, from, uh, uh, from uh, Lobedier's diary talking about how uh, you had to be, have experienced three and a half months on board ship and in the, on the ocean to appreciate how how good it is to be back on land to breathe fresh air and to experience being being back on on land. Uh, this is a passage from uh, Rochambeau's order book, and uh, it, the 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 reason I point this out is that um, uh, down here in the in this area, uh, Rochambeau is ordering a guard to be posted at the Baptist Hospital. And he's it, he's he's, in, he's indicating that. This is the, the uh, this place is the hospital and um, uh, the, uh, he identifies it as the Baptist Hospital. What's interesting is that a couple of days after the landing uh, on uh, July 23rd, Rochambeau goes to the hospital and uh, goes to mass. So this is probably the first mass that's held in Newport. And this passage is dated is from uh, Claude Blanchard's uh, journal Blanchard was the commissary of war for the French. Um, this uh, th this passage identifies Woods Castle as the as the the landing site, and what's important about this is that uh, these order books, uh, Rochambeau's order books, identified that there is a guard to be placed. There are three guards to be posted throughout the entire uh, duration of the uh, the French camp in Newport. Uh, there's a uh, a captain's guard uh, that's set up for the main camp. The captain's guard would consist of uh, a lieutenant, a sergeant, corporal, and 90 soldiers. Uh, the, uh, the guards that are set up at the hospital and at Woods Castle are uh, sergeant's guards, which can, uh, corporal's guards rather, it can, no, sergeant's guards. It consists of a sergeant, a corporal, and 12 soldiers. And those guards are changed every day and every day there's a guard at these three locations and only these three locations. <clears throat> the, uh, 
Meantime, the, uh, about the time that they're landing the troops, the Viscount de Noai is sent to Connecticut Island. Connecticut Island today is known as Jamestown Island, and that is uh, uh, opposite, uh, uh, it's actually in the middle of uh, Narragansett Bay between uh, Aquidneck Island, which is where Newport is, and the mainland. And the Viscount de Noai is, is uh, uh, Lafayette's brother-in-law. Uh, his father, the Comte de Noai, is very important in, in that uh, he is the one who influenced King Louis, probably the most important influence for King Louis to send troops to America. Well, uh, the Vicomte de Noai was, uh, was quartered in the house right next door to uh, Admiral de Tournay. And at the end of the war, uh, his wife sent a, a, a a whole set of uh, sieves, uh, uh, China, to um, to um, the Richardson family, which uh, where he was staying, as a gift for the, their treatment of their, their good treatment of her husband. So anyway, uh, <clears throat> the Vicomte de Noai is out on uh, Connecticut Island, and uh, in the meantime, the British ships are all off the coast of uh, of Newport, and they're observing what's going on. And one of the important things that uh, that, that Lobardier notes in his diary is that uh, the Vicomte de Noailles said this was the only period that uh, the, the British could have attacked the French with impunity. Uh, after that uh, that week or two uh, that uh, they were on uh, Connecticut Island, um, they had fortified the camps, they had fortified the island enough so that they withdrew the uh, troops from Connecticut Island and brought them back to, uh, to Newport. Um, in the meantime, there's a detachment of the Bourbonnet Regiment that uh, it goes to Boston. What happened is the Ile de France was the ship that was transporting them and uh, they got lost in the fog and got separated from the, uh, the rest of the fleet. So the orders were that if any ship got uh, separated from the fleet, they would go to Boston and they would meet in Boston. So when the when the, uh, the the Ile de France got lost, they they sailed directly to Boston. They arrived in Boston on uh, uh, July uh, July twenty fourth. News comes down to Newport uh, that the the ship has arrived safely and that uh, the troops were coming. The troops actually arrived in Newport on July twenty eighth. One of the important things about this Ile de France is that. Uh, not only did they carry the 350 men of the Bourbonnet Regiment, uh, this was only part of the Bourbonnet Regiment, by the way, they also carried 100,000 pounds of, uh, of gunpowder. That's about uh, 50 tons of gunpowder. I'll talk more about gunpowder a little bit later. Actually, I'll talk about it right now. Uh, one of the, the things that's mentioned in the uh, in the in Lobedier's diary, uh, very much in passing, he just says that the French celebrated a Saint Louis Day with a parade inspection and a feu de joie, uh, and lets it go at that. Uh, I want to elaborate on that. What is this feu de joie? The feu de joie is a, a sort of a, a grand firing uh, of the troops. It's it's sort of like line firing. So the the troops would line up. And you'd fire from left to right, they reload right to left, and then the whole army would fire at the same time. Now, when you're doing this by, with small companies, like a regiment or two, you just you fire by uh, by companies. Here you've got six. He came over with 6,800 soldiers. About 800 of them were uh, in the hospital. 10% uh, would have misfire. So I'm counting that you have probably about 5,000 effective shots. Uh, uh, fired in a feu de joie, and they fire three times. That's 15,000 shots, uh, musket shots, uh, by the soldiers. Um, in addition to that, the forts were, were to fire three cannon shots apiece. Well, this, th this identifies what type, what type of uh, cannons were there. And uh, so there were 61 cannons, 17 mortars, accounting for 183 shots. And the fleet would fire 21 shots per vessel. There were 48 vessels. And th this is, gives you the type of vessels. So there's 699 guns firing 1,008 cannon shots. 
the whole total of, of uh, these shots would have expended about 2,800 to 3,500 pounds of powder. That's about a ton and a half to two tons of gunpowder. That is one heck of a, fire, of a fireworks display. This is an illustration of a feu de joie held at uh, Fort Adams in Newport. And this is only a couple of companies that uh, no, not even uh, 200 men here that are uh, firing. <clears throat> Another thing uh, that the, the, uh, the Count uh, mentions in his diary is uh, a visit from Native Americans. On August 29th, they, they stay till September 2nd. Uh, the reason they want to come to, uh, you've got all these Native Americans coming to Newport. Uh, there are 20, 20, 22 representatives of the, the Iroquois, Illinois, and Four Nations coming. And the, the reason they're coming is that they were the friends, they were allies of the French during the French and Indian War. So they're coming to praise Rochambeau. They want to proclaim their allegiance to King Louis the 16th, and they want to request a priest for, for their servant for, for their, their people. Well, Rochambeau uh, accedes to their request. He gives them a, a Capuchin priest from one of the ships uh, to go with them. He, he gives him, he gives the priest leave for two months and the priest was supposed to return uh, after that leave. So after two months, the priest never showed up. So uh, he was considered AWOL, but uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Indians, or Native Americans probably needed him more than the, than the troops because every, every regiment had a, a chaplain and uh, there were one or two priests for every ship in the Navy. Um, another thing that, uh, that, that occurred was that the General, uh, General Rochambeau gave them gifts from the king. They gave him things like the necklaces, baubles, and blankets, and, and stuff like that uh, as, uh, as uh, gifts and tokens. Um, while the Native Americans were there, uh, he, he took one of the empty houses in the city and assigned, uh, assi assigned that to house the, the Native Americans. Uh, given their propensity for get, going wild when they had uh, any alcohol, uh, he, he posted a guard on, on the doors of the house 24 hours a day to prevent the, uh, the, the occupants from going out. And um, after the, uh, their first day, uh, Rochambeau inv invited them to dine with him on the following day, and he had a, uh, a pass and review so that the, uh, the Native Americans could review the troops under arms, and they were particularly impressed by the uh, uh, Lozers Hussars who, who paraded at the gallop, and they, 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 uh, they were amazed at how they handled their weapons and, uh, and did their maneuvers on horseback. Uh, they also were, were allowed to go aboard ship and they were given a, a grand tour of the uh, uh, one or two of the Navy ships. One of the things that uh, astounded them was the discipline that uh, the General Rochambeau kept in camp. Uh, one of the things that uh, the, uh, the, the, the inhabitants were afraid of was uh, you have an army in the city, the army that outnumbers the occupants of the city uh, so that uh, they're they're afraid of a lot of uh, a lot of uh, crime and, and uh, indiscipline in the in the camp. But Rochambeau kept a very strict discipline, and uh, several of the diaries mention that uh, the the camp was laid out in a in an apple orchard. And Lobedier notes that uh, uh, during this period, this is the harvest period. So uh, when the Indians arrived they were astounded that all of the apple trees were full of apples and not, none of them were, were missing apples. Had any other army been in that area, those apple trees would have been devoured bare. Uh, Lobedier also goes on to descri describe the customs and practices of the various people, particularly uh, the, uh, the, the Quakers. Uh, he, had, he comments that he attended a Quaker we uh, wedding and he describes the, uh, the, the, the wedding and says that uh, at the conclusion of the wedding, he says uh, the, the actual ceremony or the wedding resembled more of a funeral than a wedding. Uh, he also notes that on, on October 20th, there was a delegation of Abenaki and Micmac Native Americans who came to Newport to request charity. 
and he goes on to explain that uh, on September 20th to 22nd of 1780, you know, on May 20th, 1781, Rochambeau and Washington uh, met together. One at the first conference at, at Hartford, the second conference at Wethersfield, Connecticut. Um, a lot of people think, and they talk about these conferences and preparing the, uh, the, the march to Yorktown. And that is not the case because it, during the first uh, uh, conference, Cornwallis was at Petersburg, Virginia, and um, he didn't arrive in Yorktown until August 1st of 1781, several months after the Wethersfield Conference. So the conference, even though it was, it was kept uh, top secret, uh, it had to be about the plans, how the armies are going to get along, what are they, uh, Who's in who's in command? How are they going? How are they going to establish a chain of command and communication between them? Who's going to do what and so on? And since Washington was primarily uh, concerned with uh, the driving the British out of New York, uh, that was the focal point most likely of that conference. Uh, because when the French left Newport, they did not march directly to Virginia. They marched to New York. And they, uh, they had a number of uh, skirmishes in the uh, outskirts of New York, and they were planning a, a massive attack on New York City, uh, which did not, did not occur. Um, in early October, uh, I mentioned that the uh, Rochambeau wanted to keep his troops occupied, uh, and uh, he started having them uh, have war games. Well, in the process, there's always some some uh, injuries that occur in war games. And in this case, uh, one of the cannons fired a ramrod down the field and the ramrod went like head over heel and was spinning around and ended up striking a woman in the leg, breaking her leg. Um, so Rochambeau ordered the uh, head surgeon from the, the Bourbonnais Regiment to be her personal physician to take care of her during her recovery. Uh, the, the war games back then were much like reenactments that occur today, that they draw crowds of the public and people gather along the, the sides and sometimes they get a little too close and accidents occur. Uh, in November, on November 2nd, uh, the troops went into winter quarters. So they left their tents and uh, were, were quartered all around the city in various quarters. Now, there were a number of houses that were damaged uh, during the British occupation. The, uh, the, the first winter was very severe. Uh, it was so severe that the uh, Narragansett Bay froze over from, uh, at least from Newport over to Connecticut Island. Uh, and this is the only time that there's any record of the, 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 the bay freezing over to the point that you could drive uh, a horse-drawn sleigh across the bay to at least to, to, Narragansett, to uh, Connecticut Island. That same winter, there was a, a, a kidnap attempt to uh, try to capture Washington, who was down at uh, uh, Morristown. And uh, the, one of the plans was to, brought, to drive horse-drawn sleighs across the Hudson River. The Hudson River had frozen over enough that uh, you could drive horse-drawn sleighs across the river. Well, de Tournay died on December 15th. Uh, his funeral was held the next day, but Rochambeau was in Boston the day, at that time, and the Count de la Bergère was sent to Boston to, to get him and to bring him back to Newport. Well, um, Rochambeau was tired. He slept en route and uh, ne never made it to the funeral. He arrived the, the following night, the night of the 16th. De Tournay had been buried that morning. Uh, from the, the time of his death to the time of his burial, uh, the, his flagship fired uh, a cannon every half hour, and the troops on land fired musket volleys. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how many. If all the entire sol the entire army fired musket volleys, but uh, they fired three musket volleys uh, every every half hour. Whether it's in just a squad or whatever, I don't know. Um, Admiral de Tonnet, Le Bedien mentioned that uh, Admiral de Tonnet was not mourned by his officers or his, his, uh, his fleet. Uh, one of the reasons is that when they were coming to, uh, to America, 
De Tonnet had an opportunity to capture two British ships in uh, Chesapeake Bay. And instead of engaging them in combat, uh, he let them go and they, he headed up to New York instead. The troops were very angry because they had been at, uh, on board ship for three months. They were, in, at, were rearing for a fight and they were, uh, they were just, just anxious to, to shoot somebody uh, or shoot at somebody. Uh, this illustration is the, the Berkowitz map again. And down here is, along the waterfront is um, uh, the Hunter House, which was uh, uh, today's headquarters. The green line marks the line of march to Trinity Church up here, uh, where he was buried. Trinity Church is an Episcopal church, uh, which was Church of England then, but uh, there were no Catholic churches in Rhode Island at the time. So uh, uh, they decided to bury uh, De Tournay at the, uh, at, at the Anglican church, at the, at the Trinity Church. This green line marks the line of, uh, the line of march and uh, soldiers were lined up on both sides of the street, shoulder to shoulder. Now, shoulder to shoulder, shoulder to shoulder would allot 20, 20, 26 to 28 inches per man for space. Uh, this area, covering this area with uh, the, the size of the army, uh, the soldiers could have been spread out. They could have had like 30 inches per man uh, for space to stand. And that would occupy the entire army. Uh, when Lobadier says that uh, he, 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 he had a very small cortege, it meant that the, the Navy, uh, the, 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 all of the soldiers of the Navy, some 17,000 sailors, uh, did not turn out for the funeral, or very few of them turned out for the funeral. Um, so anyway, the, uh, the uh, the diary goes on and talks about uh, life in Newport, the, the five major religions that were in Newport, a, a Quaker bee, Quaker, a Quaker marriage ceremony, it talks about the Champlain family, the march to New York. Uh, and in fact, the, 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 uh, the, the march from, New, from Newport to, to, uh, to, to New York, and then eventually to New Yorktown is essentially a guidebook uh, for the, uh, the army at that time. And it's probably the, the most thorough uh, account of the, um, the, uh, what the troops encountered along the way or what they could encounter, the people, the, the terrain and so on. And uh, that, that's one of the big riches of this diary. Um, so with that, I'll, uh, I'm running out of time. So I'll, I'll open it up for questions and answers here. Great, thank you so much, uh, Mary. I will turn it over to you. Uh, thank you to those of you who have already submitted questions. Remember, you can still submit them to the chat or the Q&A. Yeah, we've had a few really good ones come in. They've been very interesting. So thank you so much. That was super informative. Um, my question, because uh, I get to lead these, is because I get to go first now, is I learned so much, but I was also so lost um, because my knowledge of the French influence is not as much as it should be. So from a learner's like beginner's experience level, where should I start to learn about some of this stuff? Because I think your information is as detailed and wonderful as it was is a little too experienced for me. So where can somebody like me who knows enough learn more on a beginner's level? Okay. Uh, what I was giving is background information. Be, be, the, the book itself just sort of mention some of these things and, and sort of expects you to know what what uh, what he's talking about. So what I was talking about tonight was giving background on understanding what's actually in the book. Now, um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> most people think that uh, the French only served at, uh, at Yorktown and uh, maybe a few other places. Some people might know that they served in Savannah. Um, because of that, I, uh, I started off uh, as an offshoot of uh, my research on the Revolutionary War. I, I, I then started working on the, the French presence. So uh, this is uh, America's ally, uh, which is, this actually covers uh, all of the, 
the, the actions that the French were involved in in the, in the war and sort of summarizes the contribution of the French in terms of number of men they sent, number of deaths, uh, uh, money, and so on and so forth. So they, uh, that would be one good place to start. Um, there are some older books. Uh, well, actually, Lobedier's diary is one of the one of the richest sources of information that uh, that uh, I could recommend on uh, on uh, on the French in uh, in in, Rhode in 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 America. Uh, other diaries are the uh, the um, uh, the Berthier, uh, Louis, Louis Alexandre Berthier uh, and um, uh, Clermont Crevecoeur, and they are. Um, I don't know that the books are available. Are, are they're no longer in print, but the many libraries have them. Uh, that they were. Um, they were published in a two-volume set on the American campaigns of the uh, Rochambeau's army in America, mm -hmm. and uh, you may find these in uh, in some libraries. They, they are also very good diaries. I could imagine. Uh, just so everybody is aware, we were given a 20% off discount code if you'd like to order the book. Sarah put the link in the chat description as well. So I, I highly encourage everybody to go use that and read some more. Um, Richard asked, how did you find out about the existence of this diary as it was in private hands for so long? How did I find out about this diary? Yeah. One of my friends is Bob Selig, uh, who is the main historian for uh, the Rochambeau Revolutionary War route from uh, from Newport to uh, to Yorktown, and uh, he told he told me about it, and told me that it hadn't been uh, it had never been published. So in a conversation we had, he suggested that I had just finished. Uh, I just finished re doing the uh, the uh, America's First Ally book, and we, I was talking to him about uh, other projects that I was thinking about doing, and he recommended doing this diary. He had used it in, in, for his, a couple of articles that he wrote, and he told me about how rich it was and uh, said it had never been published. So. Um, I, I did the translation. <laughs> Every historian's dream of this hasn't been published. I can do this. OK. <laughs> well, actually, this was not my first book. <laughs> um, it's the first the first one I did a complete translation. No, actually, I did the translation of the uh, Gazette Francoise before that. Um, but um, uh, the uh, the thing was in manuscript. So the uh, he had a copy of the microfilm and he loaned me the, the, the microfilm oh, version. And I worked on the microfilm. A forgotten art as everybody looks at PDFs these days. <laughs> um, I saw a few questions come in from a couple of participants about France's incentive to help Washington and the Continental Army defeat the British. Is there a reason that they supported the American cause or is it just the enemy of my enemy is my friend? Because they hated the British as they, as you said, the enemy <laughs> of, my, of, my, of my enemy is my friend. Uh, the French were the first ones to uh, to actually support us. They were so they, they were providing support already in 1776. Um, the the British sent 10,000 soldiers to um, New York in July of 1776. Um, the French had already prepared. Uh, Beaumarchais was uh, was was. He was the one driving the uh, the, the the secret operation behind the the, the French operation, and um, he his his uh, expectation was to put it, send twelve vessels to America. He had six of them ready to go in 1776. But what happened is uh, Edward Bancroft, which was his who was his secretary, actually it was uh, Silas Dean's secretary, was a spy. And he was a sort of double agent. So uh, the British knew what the Ameri what what was what was happening even before Ben Franklin did. And Ben Franklin was right in, in Paris. So um, the the British ambassador would object. So what what would happen is they'd load the ship, 
the British ambassador would uh, would make some objections maybe a day or so before the ship was to leave port, and they had to unload the ship again, then reload it again at night, and then finally send it out. So the first ship didn't actually arrive until 1777, and it went up to Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Oh my! So I... from Portsmouth, New Hampshire, it was unloaded, and then uh, all the stuff was disseminated around the colonies. Oh my! I. <laughs> It's amazing when you think of if they had left earlier or if they had done something so much different, how different the outcome of the war would be when tiny little right. things like that happen. You always have to go, I wonder what would have happened. Um, I saw a few questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I saw a few questions come in about the process behind translating the diary and the newspapers that you were talking about earlier. Can you talk about a little bit about your background and how you approached all of these findings? Okay, I'm, I'm a native, uh, well, my first language was French. My parents were, uh, were uh, French speakers, and uh, they, they taught me French before English, figuring that I would learn English in school soon enough. I went to bilingual schools all my life until uh, grad school. And um, when I got into grad school, I was the first time I was, uh, I was uh, in a Monolingual, monolingual <laughs> school. Um, so I, I'm very fluent in French, and uh, so I was accustomed with the uh, with the language. Uh, and in reading many of the translations, I could tell that the authors translated literally what the uh, what what the what the words were, and uh, there are actual expressions that uh, you know, like raining cats and dogs. You translate that in French into a different language, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Well, there are a lot of expressions like that in French that people would translate literally, that doesn't make any sense. So for example, like uh, the, the word uh, ornate in, uh, in the 18th century, in the Middle Ages in the 18th century uh, means kind. And there's sort of like the, that, that was the model for the, the gentleman and the knights and everybody translated as an honest man. Well, it's not like honest and you don't cheat somebody. It means you're kind. <laughs> and so there are a lot of expressions like that, that, uh, that I can tell just by reading that they translated them literally. And, um, and in, in fact, uh, when I was doing the, uh, the translation of the, the, the companion diary, uh, the, the one I'm, I'm currently working on, I'm working from a French transliteration. And the person who transliterates it says, is not familiar with uh, with military terminology, so uh, her her translate her her, she, her transcription instead of talking about a quartermaster general, she's talking about uh, a lodging master. <laughs> oh my! <laughs> that's that's what the the word is in French. It's a, the guy who takes care of the lodging, it, but the military term is quartermaster general. That sounds like a good. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> So they're, they're, it's, they're, I'm, I'm happy to know that there's people who can actually translate it because it sounds like I would make that that problem. I would have made that mistake if I was translating yeah. something. Another problem with uh, with the language at this time is you have the long the long s that looks you know within a word it looks like an mm -hmm. f and uh, an l that looks like an s and so on. So there's some letters like that that are very di difficult to uh, to um, to translate or to understand. And there was one passage that puzzled me a lot because uh, it was when the Indians were uh, visiting Rochambeau. Um, there was a word that, uh, it took me four years to realize that the difference of the, the transposition of letters. I was looking at it as, at it as Solange. Solange is a girl's name in, uh, in French and it doesn't mean anything. And so I was, trying to figure out, I, I consulted many, many dictionaries and to no avail. And finally it turned to me, it occurred to me after about three or four years that it's not Solange, it's losange, which means a bangle. <laughs> and so, yeah, I don't worry, I get confused with the long Fs and the Ss in yeah. English, and that is my primary language. <laughs> so yeah, that's one of the problems in, in handwriting as well as, uh, as in, uh, um, in script, uh, in, in print. And sometimes in handwriting, it's more difficult. And everybody's got uh, different handwriting. For example, in Rochambeau's order books, 
he's it's being the, the 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 books are kept being kept by different uh, officers at different times. So you get used to one one handwriting, then you got another handwriting. You get maybe yeah. like six different handwritings in the same book. Yep. <laughs> I can tell you, I can tell you Benjamin Talmadge's handwriting has changed in a few different pieces in our collection. I'm like, that's not how you write your L's. That's yeah. not how you did it a decade ago. Why yeah. are you writing it differently now? <laughs> yeah. and, and sometimes it's because uh, with, with uh, Lobo Dare's diary, sometimes it's because he's on, on in a carriage. And yeah. He's and he's just... while, while the, the horses are going down the bumpy roads. Yeah, I can understand how that would make a mistake or two. <laughs> We had a great question come in from Constance. She asks, interested in Colonel Green and the Rhode Island Regiment, we have a monument in Westchester County, New York in the town of Yorktown, New York with Green and the African-American and indigenous soldiers. Was it just accidental that Colonel Green was there as one of the first to meet the French in Newport or was he there specifically to greet them? He was there specifically. I wrote the description for the monument, by the way. Oh. That, that monument. <laughs> um. The small world just gets a little smaller. <laughs> I was giving it. I was attending a tour in uh, in Providence a couple of well a couple of months ago in the fall, and the the guy was the, the guide was talking about he was using that monu a picture of that monument to talk about the Rhode Island Regiment, and as the his wife was passing the the, the image around, I said she she just showed it. I said I wrote the the inscription on it, and I said there's my name right there. <laughs> <laughs> he was astounded. Well, the, the reason that they, the, the Rhode Island Regiment was there at that time is that this was an important uh, um, crossroads for communication. So it was the uh, it, both north and south and east and west. So they were they were protecting the bridges there to ensure communication and to prevent the um, the, the loyalists from coming north of, the, of there. So that's why they were there. And the, they, they were caught in a surprise attack uh, on the night of uh, May the 14th. And oh. so that's where Christopher Green got killed. Well, everybody, it's time to go look up a new monument tonight and go learn something new because you spoke <laughs> to the author of that. Uh, our, we are running up on the end of our time here. I like and I get to ask my favorite question again. So I'm so glad to be back at the lectures. If you could dine at Francis Tavern with anybody, who would it be and why? If I could what? Dine at Francis Tavern with anybody, who would it okay. be and why? Duc de Lausanne. Oh. Okay. <laughs> well, sometimes it's obvious with the answers and sometimes you'll throw me a new one. He, he is noted as being a very witty person. And um, uh, th there's uh, one of his comments in his diary is he's talking about the uh, the the American soldiers and how they were all, you know, one was a shoemaker, the other one was a carpenter, another one, you know, they all had occupations, whereas the French officers were not. They, they were they were noblemen for the most part, or for the, at least the officers were, and uh, they did not have an occupation as such. So one of his, uh, what, what, at one time during the meal, uh, somebody asked him what his father did. He says, my father does nothing. He says, we're living off his, off his fortune. And he says, what do you mean your father does nothing? You know, they're trying to figure out, you know, he had to have an occupation to have this money. And he says, no, this is all inherited money. And um, he says, my father's, uh, my father's a loafer. And he said, actually, he's a marshal of France. But he said, <laughs> he didn't want to get into an argument, you know, because these people don't know the difference between a marshal of France and a marshal in France. So he just said, just call him a loafer and said, he, he does nothing. <laughs> yep, that sounds like a conversation that you would absolutely have at a tavern. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, thank you, Mary, for facilitating our Q&A. Uh, and thank you, Norman, for all that uh, wonderful information. Like Mary said, I don't know too much about the French involvement outside of Lafayette, who everyone uh, everyone's heard of him by now. Um, so this is a great um, starting point. And as Mary mentioned before, and I put in the chat, uh, we were uh, graciously by the publisher given a discount code. I will send it through again. If you use code virtual on the publisher's website, you will get 20% off your entire order. So you can get this book and any other books you find interesting. Um, and our, a lot of our previous and future lecture speakers come from this publisher. Um, so that code is also in the email that was sent to you with the link. Uh, thank you all for joining us and for sending in your great questions.
If you would like to stay up to date with our programs, you can join our mailing list on the museum's website, francistavernmuseum.org. There you will also find all of our social media accounts so you can stay up to date. Our next lecture will be next month in February. Uh, thank you to those of you who have donated to the museum. Your generous support helps us fulfill our mission of sharing the history of the American Revolutionary Era with the public. If you would like to make a donation, you can also do that on the website. Again, that's francistavernmuseum.org. So thank you again for joining us at another Francis Tavern Museum lecture, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you all. Have a good night.